Hey everybody, it's Robert Dakota here with Worldviews Media. We got Dave Matheson with us and Cleve Hostito. Oh. And of course, Randall is joining us from Atlanta. <laughs> and we're here to uh, introduce Earth Origins that's coming up in October. We're going to give Dave the floor to get started. He's going to be talking about the star mythologies and how they connect to our origins here on Earth. Why don't you take it from there, Dave? Hey, thanks, Robert. Great to be here with Cleve and Randall and looking forward to a really great event. We're going to have some other speakers as well. And for those who aren't familiar with my work for the past dozen plus years, I guess 13 plus years now, I have been researching and exploring the connections between the world's ancient myths and the stars and a celestial pattern that is worldwide. There is evidence, abundant evidence that proves beyond a doubt that the world's ancient myths are built on a common system of celestial metaphor. And that includes the myths of ancient Egypt, the myths of ancient Sumer and Babylon, the myths of ancient India, the myths of ancient Greece, the Norse myths, the stories in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament are built on this exact same system. So that is very, that's, there's enormous implications to the provable evidence that the Bible shares the same common foundation pattern as the Greek myths, the myths of ancient India, the myths of ancient China, and it goes around the globe, all the different inhabited continents. So the myths and sacred traditions of the nations of the Americas, there's evidence that they're using this same system. And again, that conventional paradigm of ancient human history will have problems with that. If I walked into a university and said, I find strong evidence that the patterns underlying the myths of ancient Greece are the same system as the myths of the Norse in Northern Europe and the same system as the stories of the Bible. Already, I'm going to start getting resistance and pushback and the myths of ancient in India and ancient Egypt and ancient China and Japan, ancient Japan. But then if I say, oh, and by the way, the Americas, they're going to say, stop right there. There's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. I don't want to hear that. And by the way, also the sacred traditions of the Pacific, the Maui stories that are, yeah. that's the cultures that stretch all the way from the islands, the Hawaiian islands, all the way down to Tahiti, to the uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Easter Island, Rapa Nui, that culture their stories are using this same and the connections are very powerful. So I just, I will present some of that evidence and we'll talk about it and we'll go out and look at the stars at this event. I'm really excited to get back to Arizona, the beautiful star night sky that we saw the, the last time we were there, Cleve and Robert and Randall, we were all together. What month was that? We were there. That was April. April this year. April, yeah. So, um, so what's really cool is I just prepared just a couple of slides to just familiarize people with a little bit of this evidence. And before, um, you know, I prepared these before I got on this call with Cleve and, and everybody. And Cleve and I were talking, and he started talking about, oh, we're having tremendous lightning right now. It's the monsoon season. And I said, well, that's really interesting because in my slides, I'm talking about a thunder god and a lightning god. and then. I said, oh, and I might be talking a little bit about eagles. And Cleve said, oh, I just got this shirt last night, uh, you know, because of the eagle. And I said, that's really amazing that all the things that I put into my slideshow, you already somehow saw into the future. Or you yeah. have a, it's you it's a cool. It's very Sedona, Dave. Uh -huh. <laughs> These things just can't help but happen when you start connecting with Sedona. But anyway, mm -hmm. let me just show you. So when I say all the world's ancient myths are connected by the stars, 
people often kind of nod their heads and say, oh, that sounds interesting, but what exactly are you talking about? They're the figures in the stories, Moses can be shown to be a constellation. And King Solomon, constellation, David, whom I'm named after, the father of Solomon. And the way they're arranged in the sky shows you that David is the father of Solomon. It's really interesting. And it shows you that Solomon built the temple, not David, because David's a different constellation. The temple is a constellation that's associated with Solomon. Specific constellations with specific figures. But just before I just show this, just I just want to like pause and take a breath and think like, how did this happen? Or what is this saying about our human history? It shows that there's something about humanity's history that is not part of the conventional paradigm right now. Like I said, if I went into a university, they would have, this is not widely accepted that there are connections between the stories of the Bible and the sacred traditions of cultures in the Americas or in the Pacific or in India. And yet I can show it and that they're connected to the stars. That breaks open the paradigm of ancient history because either there was some kind of connection that was going across the oceans or another possibility. There's a lot of different possibilities. One possibility is that there was a civilization even before ancient Egypt, even before ancient Sumer, even before ancient India. These are very ancient ancient China, ancient Japan, the Americas. We know that Graham Hancock's most recent book, America Before, finds evidence of all kinds of advanced, sophisticated cultures creating this special soil in the Amazon. Um, and maybe there was ancient civilizations in the Amazon that may be before ancient Sumer even. That's what he talks about in, in his book. There's missing pieces. We're, like Graham always says, a species with amnesia. And I always like to add, I'm sure Graham and Randall wouldn't disagree with me. It may be trauma-induced amnesia. Maybe it had to do with cataclysms, yeah. uh, terrible events that caused humanity to have to actually go underground. So maybe there was an ancient culture that predates Sumer and predates Egypt and predates India, because all those cultures in their very first myths already are using this system. In the earliest writings of Babylon or before Babylon, Sumer, the Gilgamesh epic, or Bilgamesh, as he was uh, called in some of the Sumerian uh, spellings, already those very ancient texts are using this system. So let me just show a couple of pieces of evidence very few, just to, this, the evidence is so abundant. Um, you know, I've written books that are over 5,000 pages altogether now. Um, not one book, 5,000 pages, that'd be too much. I think the, the longest one has 900 something pages, but uh, the, there's just, there's so much evidence I have to leave out most of it. Like you could fill libraries with the amount of evidence. So let me share my screen just to show a couple, try and convince people that this is true, what, I'm, what I just said. Let me know when you can see my screen. Can you guys see it? Yep. yep. Like you can. Cool. So let me show yeah. you. Uh, it's really, really special that you were talking about lightning and, and also wind. You were talking about, you know, whirlwinds. And uh, so this is a, this is a vase that still, still exists. They had to piece it back together. It was broken into pieces. And a lot of the paint from this ancient artist has flaked off, but we can see already that the ancient artist or someone who knew how to write, if the ancient artist didn't write this, has identified this figure for us. It says right there in the Greek letters, Zeus, this is the thunder oh, god. Wow. It says there, th that letter right next to his nose that looks like our letter I, uh -huh. that's, that's their Z. Uh -huh. And then it's E, U, and an S. So that's Zeus. And he's wielding a thunderbolt you can see it he's got it up over his head and he's got his other arm so he's brandishing this powerful thunderbolt over his head 
and his other arm is reaching forward. Now some of the paint has flaked off, so I'm going to uh, actually draw it in. Artists and archaeologists have kind of pieced this together. This is from around, they think, 550 BC, or you could say BCE if you prefer. It's the same number, 550. It's somewhere around 550, maybe as uh, a little bit later, 530, but somewhere in that 20 year period, they think this painting. So I'm going to draw in some of the parts that flaked off. You can see this yeah. deep lunge. See how he's in that deep lunge uh -huh. posture? And uh, also, I'm going to bring in. Uh, so I've drawn in some of the paint that's flaked off and also some of his robe. I just kind of filling it in for you there. He's wearing kind of like a shawl over his shoulders as he's reaching forward. So I just want to note all these different characteristics. Heel is up on that back foot. Knee is bent and down. He's got the other knee is really bent and up. He's got one arm brandishing a big uh, lightning bolt over his head, thunderbolt and the other hand reaching forward. So now I'm gonna bring in a Maya Codex. This is called the Dresden Codex. The Dresden Codex, it's still in existence. It's one of the few that escaped the horrific destruction of ancient wisdom when those conquistadors came over from Europe and promptly gathered up all the ancient codexes and made bonfires. It's just horrific when you read about it. But this one survived and it's called the Dresden Codex. And this is actually page two of the Dresden Codex. And you can see all the, the Maya glyphs there, those different symbols. Yeah. In the, and there's some numbers. You can see the numbering system. There's three, three images in the middle one. There's some numbers to the left of it. You can see those. Yeah. And also down right. at the bottom. The system. And then right here. Yeah. So now it's I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a box around one of these three figures, that one I'm interested in right there, because I just want to point out some similarities. Let's make them bigger. Do you see any similarities? Now they're pointing in opposite no, directions. No, we don't, no. <laughs> first of all, first Not of all, all. No, deep knee think. bend, <laughs> deep knee bend, heel raised, heel raised, other arm very forward. In this case, the, Maya artist has put the thunderbolt in the forward hand. That's not the way we usually see it with Zeus, but look at the thunderbolts. Like the thunderbolts themselves yeah. have yeah. huge similarities. Like yeah. the thunderbolt are huge. Now, really interesting to me is that Zeus almost always has a big full square beard, right? Zeus yeah. and Hercules and Randall Carlson have this square shape to their head, <laughs> right? Because they got a full beard. Now, this Maya deity, he doesn't have a full beard, but he has a square-shaped headdress, okay? So that's important. So I'm just calling out some details. One arm forward, thunderbolt weapon, deep lunge, which is almost an identical posture. Now, that also that Maya god has something on his shoulder. Can you see, can you see what's sitting on his shoulder? It's, a, it's actually an eagle. Bird. I'm yeah, he's got an eagle on his shoulder. You can see the head of the uh -huh, eagle yeah. is right down beneath that oh, cool. god's chin. And you can see the tail is kind yeah, of right almost here. connecting that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a stab eagle I'm working on. <laughs> now, isn't that cool? Now, Zeus so is also, bad. Zeus is associated with an eagle. Not in this painting. Uh -huh. this, the, you know, the, you can actually go see this painting of, of Zeus in the... Um, Antique Museum of Munich in Germany. That's where it is today. But uh, Zeus, we know from the myths, is associated with the eagle. And then here's this god in a Maya codex associated with an eagle in the exact same posture. Now, why could that be? Just coincidence? Let's take a look at um, the stars in the heavens. Now, I'm going to show, just in case that um, you know antique vase was a little bit too hard to see. This is a drawing by an artist, a modern artist, but I didn't make this. This is, you know, this, this artwork has been around. In this actual vase, Zeus is fighting Typhon. That's a whole nother constellation, Typhon, and I can show what constellation that is, but for now, I'm just going to focus in on Zeus. But I'm just showing this drawing because I'm going to use that um, for showing 
the constellations. And then here's the uh, here's the Maya God. So let me show you um, the, the stars of the sky. Now, I'm going to do the outline a little bit brighter so that people at home can see it. And if you're watching on a little tiny phone screen, you might want to go to an iPad or a big computer so you can see it a little better. But I will do the outlines a little bit stronger so that you can see them. But even now, looking at your screen, you might be able to pick out a constellation that has some similar outlines to what we just saw. And I'm going to outline it right now, mm -hmm. right there. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. That is a constellation that is known as Hercules. Hercules. And you might say, what? Hercules? Mm -hmm. I thought we were talking about Zeus. Well, in the yeah. myths, Hercules is the son of Zeus. So there's a connection between Hercules and Zeus. Hercules always has a big square beard as well. He carries a club usually instead of a thunderbolt. But can you see the similarities between this outline of Hercules and the outline of Zeus? Look at it. Zeus has a deep knee bend, the outline of Hercules, deep knee bend. The heel is raised on the back heel. Look at the outline of Hercules in the sky. Now, in the Hercules outline of the constellation, don't get caught up in the fact that the name of the constellation is Hercules. The constellations all play these different characters in different myths. In the Bible, there are figures associated with this same constellation, but they're not called Hercules, of course. That's just the name we give the constellation, but it will play different gods or different heroes. And it'll sometimes play female characters, sometimes play male characters. But the square-shaped head gives rise to the fact that it's often a male character with a full beard. But sometimes like Medusa or the Gorgons, who are female characters, they'll have like snakes all coming around. And if you look at the ancient artwork, their head will look square, like the snakes almost look like a beard. Or there's an Egyptian god named Bess, who has a lion head with a mane, and he's associated He'll be in that same posture sometimes. But look at the outstretched arm of Zeus in the artwork and the outstretched arm. One arm is reaching down and then brandishing a big weapon overhead, which is sometimes envisioned as a thunderbolt. And let me bring up the Maya god here. Here's the Maya god. Also, same posture, square-shaped headdress goes along with the square-shaped head in the heavens. So these are gods or characters who are associated with a specific constellation and their adventures will have to do with the other constellations nearby in the heavens. For instance, let me take away the Zeus picture. This Maya codex tells us that gods associated with this constellation will sometimes be associated with an eagle. And the reason is, look just to the left of the foot of Hercules constellation. I'm gonna outline here. This is one way of outlining it. That is a constellation that is known as Aquila, the eagle. <laughs> Aquila or Aquila is the Latin word for a eagle. In Spanish, it's Aguila. All they do is change the Q into a G. Aguila is an eagle. So we know that constellation is associated with an eagle. That's its name. That's why eagles are associated with Zeus or in the Maya image. I don't know what that god is in the codex, but He's a thunderbolt god for sure. Look at that thunderbolt. And he's an eagle god. He's got one perched on his shoulder. So we can see clear connections to a constellation. And just in case that's not enough, I've got another Maya. This is Maya artwork on a drinking vessel. This is called cool. a codex cup. It's codex cup. because it's got like, um, it's almost like it's got a document on the cup itself so it curves around and um we think this one's from the 700s either the 600s or the 700s uh ad or ce so much much later than that uh, zeus artwork but look at that this is this is a god we know who this is this is a god whose name is chalk and he's a rain god chalk is a rain god zeus is a thunder god and a lightning god, and chalk is a rain god. And so look at this outline. We've got another raised knee 
And then on the back foot, the heel is raised. He's actually holding a weapon over his back with one hand, except it's pointing the other way. It's an ax instead of a thunderbolt, but that's the ax of chalk there. Can you see it? It's actually pointing down towards the back of his foot. It's like an ax. It's a stick like with a long stone on it. And then he's also got his arm stretched way out. So I'm just going to fade out this codex. Oh, by the way, you can go see this codex, uh, codex cup. It's a beautiful piece of art. You can see it in the Met in uh, New York City, in the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And uh, let me just fade this out. Now, like I said, if you go to the Met, you'll read that it's from the 700s. You'll read that it's Chalk, the rain god. You won't read that it's based on the same constellation system that shows why Zeus looks like this, why other gods around the world that are associated with that constellation. But let's fade out Chalk a little bit and we can see I've put in, this is the actual outline of the constellation Hercules in the sky. Let me draw the outline. Now, I know their hands don't exactly line up, but look at the feet. Look at the foot posture. Look at the out. So Chalk has one arm going back and holding an ax. And he's got one arm going forward and grasping like a disc or something. Now, archaeologists and Maya experts disagree over what that disc is. They don't know exactly. They got different ideas. But I know what it is. It's a constellation. <laughs> it's a constellation that Hercules figures, figures associated with Hercules, are always grasping. But just I just want to point out, look at the amazing correspondences. I mean, the, the back arm is almost, it starts out in the exact same angle. The legs are in the exact same angle. Well, and, the, uh, the hair kind of matches the sword. <laughs> Yeah, on his head, kind of matches. Great point. Angle yeah, it does. Board. It does. He's got instead of having a a sword over his head, he's got an arching crest of hair. Very excellent observation, um, Robert. Because actually, in other myths, instead of a sword, it will sometimes be an angel's wing, or it'll sometimes be a cloak, like Odysseus in the Odyssey will often weep and pull his cloak up over his head oh, so yeah. that so that nobody sees him weeping that and and when he does that he's also associated with hercules sometimes but i want to show you the constellation so i'll bring back in the codex and i'll fade it back out i just wanted to show you how closely these match up and as i fade it out there's another constellation look at that ring that chalk is holding with his forward hand there's a constellation right next to hercules that Hercules figures will sometimes be shown grabbing. And that is the Corona Borealis, the Northern crown. I'm gonna outline it for us right now, right there. That is in the sky. There's the Northern crown. Now look at Chalk. <laughs> His arm isn't exactly in the right place, but the Northern crown is exactly in the right place. Like I'm still waiting for the Metropolitan Museum of Art to call me up and say, Dave, when can you come? out to New York, we'll pay for you to come lecture about this cup and we'll bring in all kinds of art history professors because they'll <laughs> certainly be interested in this. No, they they haven't yet. But um, what really probably makes them nervous to do that is I'm gonna say, and this is connected to artwork of Zeus from ancient Greece from like 500 BC. And they'll say, um, okay, there's the door, you know, get right out. And don't don't call us, we'll call you. Because there's when you're saying that there's a connection worldwide and it's based on some ancient system that is shared by all these cultures, that flies in the face of the conventional paradigm. But it actually makes a lot of sense if, as researchers like Graham Hand Hancock and Randall Carlson have argued. There is evidence for an advanced ancient culture that predates some kind of cataclysm. And it's quite likely that this cataclysm separated the different cultures 
maybe people had to live underground for a while. There may have been radioactivity. There may have been, uh, you know, all kinds of radiation or other things. We don't know. But if they had to live underground, then when they started to come out, they would carry with them the pieces. But different areas of the globe might put a different spin on them. Some places might remember more of this part. It's like a puzzle that used to be put together and then a comet or something came in and scattered the pieces all over. And now one part of the world has this part a little bit more, and but they're all can be shown to have some kind of connection that's really intriguing and mysterious. And it informs, and it connects the Bible too, which the Bible is based on the same system. So that's all I'm gonna show <laughs> for now. I've talked a lot. I didn't mean to uh, monopolize the conversation just to kind of kick it off. This is related to so many other amazing things that we could research. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's good stuff, uh, <clears throat> Dave. And I think, you know, it's a great way to introduce the Earth origins because um, some people have said, you know, why, why are you so interested in studying ancient cultures? What about now? And I think by studying ancient cultures, we learn a lot about the present and the different cycles and patterns that keep happening uh, to humanity. So that's what it has to do with now. And also, you know, the evidence that you're bringing up, it shows that it seems like that we've had some interconnectedness in ancient history. Uh, and that, that in itself is valuable, isn't it? <laughs> to it's, us so, now? it's so, and, and, you know, I'm so excited when I first met Cleve, we had so many different things in common. We were both in the 82nd Airborne and, uh, you know, I prepared all this, these images and, and I didn't even know that there's a connection between the Zuni and the Maya in your traditions. Um, you know, it's like, there's so many connections and, and you mentioned rhythms you know, the cycles, I think it's all rhythm, like our life, the, the drumming that Cleve did last time was just so powerful. And around the world, we use drums to get into touch with other aspects of reality. And that's connected to the stars too, the, the cycles of the heavens, the different shamanic um, use of the drum sometimes they'll go up a tree with seven steps which relates to the planets and the sun and the moon add up to seven the visible planets and so they're going into the heavens which give us all these cycles and it just ties in and connects so much and i feel like we've been divided like the bible has been used to divide people like oh do you don't believe this then you're outside but this shows that actually we're all connected it sh this should actually unite us instead of dividing us and the last thing i'll say is the trauma of uh you know trauma induced amnesia i am convinced that these ancient myths actually show trauma they illustrate it and they illustrate its effects they show like I always mention the Garden of Eden. There's trauma involved there. You're going to get kicked out and now you're going to have to sweat and you're going to have to die and you're going to have pain in childbirth. And actually the story even shows di being divided from yourself because before they're comfortable in their own skin and they're naked and they're unashamed. But then there's some kind of trauma that separates them from even who they are, the story can be shown to be based on the stars. It's not literal, but it's showing trauma because then they're ashamed of who they are. So now they've been separated from themselves. Then they get separated from nature. They get separated from God or from the divine, from creator. It's showing division. So I think that these myths are actually showing to us the effects of division from our own self and they're pointing us how to 
repair that. And so I'm really happy that you said, people ask, well, what about today? What, you know, all this ancient stuff, how does that apply to me? That's what we're all dealing with. Separation from self. If you have, <laughs> if you have addiction, you know, these, these cutting edge healers tell us if you have addiction, it's because of the pain of separating from yourself that probably you don't even know it happened. That's what you're searching for. Well, the myths are trying to show you, yeah, this is what you're searching for. And here's, let me help point you towards how to recover your own self. No, I said a lot, but uh, I, I really like what you said, Robert. Yeah, that's cool, Dave. And we, we've got some uh, nights that we'll be going out on the land with you like we did last time uh, when Randall was here with us. Um, so, and even though Randall may, is not going to be able to be here with us in person, he's going to be here virtually with us. But last time at Earth Day, we didn't get to follow up and, and have Randall give the, the call to action. So this time, we're going to give you the lead, Randall, so you can bring up the Sanctuary Project and any other, you, you might be talking about the Torrids a little bit. Well, it's an appropriate time of year to talk about the Torrid, certainly. <clears throat> yeah, and there's mythologies there connected to the holidays or the holy days of Halloween. Yeah, oh yeah. <clears throat> well, a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that there is a major meteor stream that peaks uh, right around the day, a couple of days leading up and a couple of days after Halloween. And... Um, this is where, you know, ancient stories that have come down to us in the form of, like you said, holidays, holy days are connected exactly with what Dave is talking about in terms of the, you know, because everything that Dave is saying brings forward this scenario that the earth and the heavens have in interacted on, undoubtedly in multiple ways. And one of those, when Dave is talking about the, um, the trauma, we certainly now have in hand a mountain of hard evidence that there have been actually multiple traumas. Um, however, there does seem to be a compressed period surrounding bracketing what's called the Younger Dryas, which dates from about 11,600 to 12,900 years ago, in which apparently the evidence now suggests the earth suffered a sequence of traumas compressed into this one air, one time frame, this one epoch. And uh, so, yeah, 100%. And the other thing is that once we understand the nature and the extent, the degree, the magnitude, the severity, the intensity of these traumatic events, we certainly can understand why whatever preceded it is going to be hard to discern. Because the, the nature of the overturning of the old order of the world is so complete that mm. what was there before is only going to be found in traces. However, I think those traces are extant enough that we can begin to assemble the pieces. You know, this idea that you said that uh, why should we study the ancient times instead of the, uh, you know, instead of the now? Well, we should, of course, be completely in tune with the now, but don't. Here's the thing. You are not going to have any framework for even understanding what's going on now without, you know, it'd be like if I picked up this book and this is a book of world history, it's actually a dictionary, but I do have in the other room, the Columbia uh, history of the world, a nice big fat, which is one of my goals to read. But okay. To say we're only interested in the now would be like to open this book and say, I'm going to only look at the last two pages. I'm not even interested in all of this that preceded it. But, and, and then don't you know, pretend that by looking at the last two pages that you necessarily understand what's in that book. You see what I'm saying? And the other thing is that, that, that I keep resonating with, with what Dave talks about when he says that there appears to have been a culture, we'll call it an antediluvian or a prehistoric, meaning before history, culture that seemed to have this comprehensive celestial template. And that template became the basis for, for developing and establishing these stories that have been handed down. I mean, my God, 
how many generations these stories are in their various forms and incarnations have been handed down through the centuries, through the millennia. And now this idea that they were, that some, that these ancient cultures dispersed about the globe were working from a common template. Does that suggest that there was something that preceded it that now is largely invisible yet has left its fingerprints in numerous places. And I think about this universal template and I can't help but think about the parallel to that that I've been studying, which is that when you begin to look at the sacred architecture of the world and it could all of the, all of the cultures that, that Dave mentioned, we can look at the Egyptians, we look at the Greek, we, Greece, we can look at the Norse, we can look at megalithic Europe, we can look at um, the New World. We can look at Native American, Hopi, Hopewellian, Mississippian. We can look at the Pueblo. We see it there. We see it in all these places. And we look at the sacred architecture and the temples. And whether it's a cathedral in France, and I'll show you something here in a minute. I'll show a couple of slides. Or, or looking at, nobody's going to mistake a, 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 a cathedral from the Middle Ages for a Greek temple. And, and most people who've got a little bit of understanding of architectural history will not mistake an Egyptian. They can dis discern the differences between an Egyptian and a Greek temple. You come over here to the New World and there are temples, sacred places. Um, you know, the great monumental earthworks of uh, North America, uh, they're laid out in a certain way, you know, and cognizant, ever cognizant of the cardinal directions and the movements of the heavens overhead. But in terms of just as there is a celestial component to the to the framing of, of these ancient uh, ancient patterns of civilization manifesting in the temples and in the sacred precincts and in the uh, the holy cities, you could David mentioned the Bible, the the model of the holy city in the Bible lays out a very specific geometry. So speaking of geometry, what I'm getting at here is that even though you look at the widespread diversity of ancient sacred architecture, the outer expression underneath and behind it, they're all working from the same template. They're all working from the same template of geometry. And I have pondered the very same thoughts as David. Okay. Because as soon as we see the emergence of these cultures, they are using this geometry, this geometric template. So did they in, did the Chinese, did the, did, did, did the uh, Native Americans, uh, did the Egyptians, did the, the megalithic builders who put up Stonehenge and others, did they each individually conceive of this, you know, in isolation from everyone else? And then across the world in these various cultures, in these various periods of history, is it, it it's born spontaneous out of, out of, some substratum of consciousness or is there a tradition that's being handed down that ultimately comes from a source i personally think it's a bit of both but i don't think you can actually say because it is something that's that's ingrained into our consciousness and and very much in the stand uh, from the perspective of what dave was talking about with a uh, uh with trauma trauma affecting i think that trauma is still affecting what's happening today it's affecting things that are happening in, in individual relationships and in international relationships, in political relationships, in religious relationships. I think that trauma is still playing out. The echoes of that trauma are still alive and well in the human species in our subconscious. And until we come to terms with what our ancestors went through and who we actually are and who we are descended from, we're not going to be able to resolve that trauma. But it really begins, part of it, I think, is understanding that there is a veil that separates this latest round of history, which in geological terms, uh, geologists will call the Holocene, the whole of the recent epoch, the whole Holocene scene is like Cenozoic is the, uh, is the recent, right? Um, the recent uh, uh, period. The so in in that uh, in that framework, we've got ten thousand years. We look at we we've, we've got 
within that 10,000 years, we can look at the history of the domestication of animals. And we see that, oh, eight, nine, 10,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, immediately post this transition. Uh, look at the first urban complexes that show up between seven and 9,000 years ago. You know, look at the, the first major agricultural settlements and communities. Uh, look at the dispersion of languages about the world that generally goes back to some proto language that's dated around 10 or 11 or 12,000 years. If we follow this back, we come to this veil. And the 10,000 years of what we could call recent history, the last half of which is, constitutes our recorded history, and the first appearance of the, these, the major civilizations such as Sumer and Egypt and, and so on, or in the Indus Valley, um, we have that appear, we have that 10,000 year period. Then we have the veil. And on that other side of that veil, we have ancestors, modern humans who were our ancestors stretching back perhaps as long as a quarter million years. I mean, we, we can say certainly 180 to 200,000 because we now have dated skeletons of modern humans that are 180,000 years old. Well, I mean, think of a, think of, 5,000 years of recorded history to 200,000 years of actual history of modern humans on this planet. Do we assume that during all of that span of time through those hundreds and hundreds of generations, there was no accumulated learning? There was no discovery of scientific um, processes or no ability to influence and control the environment? Um, that there was nothing passed on from generation to generation within that whole span of time. Yet here we are now in a civilization where most of the world that surrounds us now is the product of like the last 200 years, you know, three, four, five generations. I like to point out that when my grandparents were born, the main mode of transportation was on foot or horse. My grandparents, you know, couple, 1895, a couple of my grandparents were born in 1895. So how much has the world changed in this brief space, in three generations? Now, if you figure you've got hundreds of generations, well, see, here's the thing that, that all of the pseudo skeptics and the critics of the ideas that we're exploring, they fail to understand. They fail to have this big picture comprehension that the story, that there's a deep history that the planet has suffered repeated catastrophes, that around the Younger Dryas, so-called, there was probably even a series of catastrophes, and whatever one of them didn't destroy, another one did. And it's probably very lucky that we human species survived. And our ancestors who lived through the beginning and the ending of the Younger Dryas, and all of the uh, foreshocks that led up to it, and the aftershocks that followed in the millennia after um, wouldn't have survived if they didn't have foreknowledge of how the world works, how the world actually works, that there is a cyclical system, that we're part of a cyclical system that's periodic. And I think that's one of the most important of the ancient teachings that has come down to us is this idea of the cyclicity and, and, and <clears throat> that the rise and fall of civilizations is completely embedded within those natural cycles. Once we make that connection, I think we're going to go a long way towards being able to establish or, or, or put down the foundation for a viable future civilization on this planet, which we are not at yet. We do not have a, a blueprint for a sustain, sustainable civilization, a long-term sustainable civilization on this planet. We do not. But that brings us to the whole question of how do we achieve that? And this is where we have to have a real, we have to have an authentic educational process, which we do not, which we do not have now. And so when you bring up the sanctuary project and the ideas that we've been kicking around that I think are naturally going to be emerging out of this work that this, that, that us alternative researchers are doing is going to be an alternative system of education that, that exposes people to these kinds of ideas, this kinds of information that does not segregate people according to these artificial hierarchies like by age, 
I'm really going now for the classes and the tours that we're doing. I'm really encouraging. You know, I, I people would say, well, I can't go on the tour because, you know, I've got my kids. They're eight and 10 and bring your kids, bring your kids. That's, you know, kids and adults, we need to be doing stuff together. Kids need to be learning from they're adults and become part of the adult world. By the time they get to their adolescence, there's no adolescence. Do not keep them sequestered in this perpetual infancy right up through college age. And hey, let's let's uh, admit that uh, it seems like a lot of college age kids these days uh, are regressing to infantile behavior and throwing temper tantrums over some of the most insignificant things you could con could even conceive of. But that's a different subject. So out of all of this, these conferences, the meetings, the classes, what we're doing over the internet, I see a worldwide community beginning to form of people who are beginning to actually ask questions, serious questions about who we are, where we came from, what are our origins, how are we all interconnected, what do we have in common, and out of that, by reaching back to the wisdom of the past, I think we're going to be able to gain the insight to have a greater possibility, probability of creating that sustainable long-term civilization. And I think the broad outlines of that blueprint have come down to us through multiple venues, symbolical systems, including the sacred geometry that unites the temples and including the mythology now that is linking the world of the present and the world of the past with this celestial domain that, that sustains our existence. It, you see, the, you've got to really get in the forefront of your consciousness that this world that we inhabit is not like an isolated ecosystem. It is part of a much greater cosmic natural infrastructure that sustains this. And so, I mean, there's so much I could add to what Dave has said, particularly now when we're, we're linking some of the geometries, the sacred geometry to this, this the, the sacred astral material that Dave is dealing with. Um, and we're going to, we're going to see that there was, I think, a science of, of resonance. You might call it resonance. And it was about setting up the infrastructure on the face of this earth that was somehow in harmony. See, in geometry, when you have two, or mathematics, when you have two irreconcilable things or forces in physics or, or in mathematics, you're looking for this third thing that can serve to integrate the two. It, it requires the introduction of that first, that third thing. The Greeks had a term for it. They call it stereometry. It's one of the things we study in sacred geometry. So the, the thing to do that they were looking for was to create, this is why, okay, below you have the template of sacred geometry that's governing the, 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 the shape, the form, the outer expression of the sacred architecture, the temples and so on. Well, at the same time, the placement and the origin and orientation of that template is not random. It's set out to completely relate to the movement of the cosmos above. So the lines of a the axial alignments are not random. They point to specific celestial events that occur at certain times of the year or at certain epochs by using a, a horizon calendar. And I think this is where God, I, I just, I get so blown away when I start thinking about the possibilities we've got here, because, um, you know, and I know there's other people out there doing incredible work, too, that's really beginning to come together. I mean, you know, Dave mentioned Graham Hancock, of course, he's in, been in the forefront of this for 35 years now. Um, and he's received a lot of abuse from people who are afraid. I think they're, see, here's the thing. The picture that's emerging is so powerful. It's so big. It, it, it basically challenges everything about our current models of reality. That there's like, no, we don't want to go there. There's a veil there. We do not want to see what's on the other side of that veil. But like in the quest for the Holy Grail, and keep this in mind, quest. The quest, what it boils down to is the quest for the Grail. And the Grail is the summum bonum. It's the ultimate thing. It's, that, it's the thing that can heal the divergences. It can, it can heal the wasteland. It can heal the deb debilitated king, right? It can also heal a devastated world in the aftermath of, of trauma. Well, the quest for that grail boils down to this. 
it just boils down to asking the right questions. Because at the root of all questions is the quest. And when Percival found, stumbled serendipitously upon the castle Corbanic, after encountering the disguised Fisher King fishing in the river, when he discovered that, he was presented with a majestic, magnificent, mind-blowing uh, series of events. And he had been told by one of his teachers that it was some impolite to speak out of turn. It's better to remain silent. Um, he didn't say that there were times, though, when you needed to actually ask questions. And this whole display, this majestic, magnificent display within the Castle Corbanic, this parade of young people carrying these miraculous things, a miraculous candelabra, a lance dripping blood, the grail itself that when the, the maiden came in carrying, the youth came in carrying the, the grail, the, 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 the hall, the great hall in Corbanic became illuminated as if it was a, as if it was a star. There's, it goes through this whole de description of something which is obviously and clearly cosmic in origin. Now here's Percival, he sits there watching this whole thing and he's mute. He doesn't, he does not inquire as to the meaning of this procession, right? He goes to sleep and he wakes up the next morning. Now, remember he's in this great hall, uh, magnificently arrayed with decorations and opulence and, you know, um, riches and, and all of this. He goes to sleep and he wakes up in the morning and it, the hall is desolate. It's as if it's been abandoned for centuries. There's nobody there. The castle is abandoned. He wanders around and uh, he can't figure out what happened. So in, in a stupor, he walks out of the castle and he's leaving the castle. And this old hag comes running at him out of the woods, screaming at him, screaming at him. And her, she's got this long tangled hair. That's important. Long hair is important in this story. She's screaming at him. All you had to do was ask the question and the curse would have been lifted. The king would have been healed. The wasteland would have been restored. But you sat there and you did not ask the question that this whole procession, this whole display of magnificence, this opulence was presented to you so that you would ask the question, what does it mean? And you didn't ask. So here's the wasteland will continue. The king will remain on his couch because he cannot arise because he's so weak. He didn't ask the question. And now we're living in an America where it's rapidly becoming a crime to ask the wrong questions. It's certainly a, a, a basis a, a, for one to uh, be ostracized from you know, the, the, the uh, custodians of the conventional reality. So you can't ask the question unless you are willing to take risks. So I think we have to take risks. We have to ask questions about everything that's going on. Everything that we see deserves and requires and demands that we ask questions. Because if we don't, we're going to be like Percival. Now, Percival, it was his job right there in his name, Percival, he was, his mission was to pierce the veil. See, the veil is what separates us from the modern world and the lost deep history. That if we're going to survive, I think we have to connect with. We have to reconnect with that story that's come down to us. And what, a, what an incredible concept that you could take this story, this deep history, and project it onto the sky because look, the world around us is, is frail. It changes. Temples, sacred temples crumble eventually. Destruction destroys the sacred precincts and we, we can no longer, we, we're only looking at the rubble. But the heavens above, they remain virtually fixed from century to century to century. And the changes that do occur, of course, are highly significant. But there, is it, there it is. It's mapped on the heavens. So whoever this was, yes, they created this, this template 
And here is the template, the blueprint for building your civilization, the cosmic civilization. Here is the blueprint for building the holy city. But because of the fact that we know the nature of change down here on the earth below, we know that after a period of time, it's likely that this template that is going to be growing out of the earth could be destroyed. So we're going to project the whole story, the deep history of this species and this planet up onto the heavens. And there it is. And Dave is putting it all together. And he's bringing these stories back, stories that I think have been waiting 10 or 12,000 years to be told, Dave. Well, that was a great story you just told, Randall. And the, <laughs> the Knights of the Round Table, it's yes. clearly a celestial Ooh. story. <laughs> I mean, and I can, show you the, I can show you the grail, actually, in the sky. But, I know you can. <laughs> but, uh, you and it can. ties in. It ties into the recovery of trauma, just like yeah. you said. It is connected to the very constellation that it, that has to do with healing of trauma. So, and and uh, it's really powerful the way you told it about look all this heavenly glory, <laughs> but you didn't ask what does it mean? All this, you know, all this symbolism, but you didn't try to understand it. And the cycles of the heavens, you know, I think we're really blessed that Cleve is going to be there too, because Cleve, some of the things that you've shared about cycles and knowing before, and how did they know before, because they were tied into the history. I mean, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm just excited that you're going to be there with all that wisdom that you have from all the different um, sources that you you have it from. I don't know if there's any things you want to say about it, but I'm really excited. And, you know, you tie into the cycles with the things that you say, but also with your drumming. Like the highlight of the whole thing for me was when we were sitting there in Robert's house, just impromptu, and you said, play, play the didge with my drum. And I'd never been in sync with a drum before playing the didgeridoo until that time. And it was just like magical. So anyway, I just, I wanted to throw it over to you, Cleve, to, to, <laughs> what are you pointing at, a drum? You know, I know you About four drums. Yeah. I know. Oh, wow. Ranging yeah. in origin from West Africa to the Middle East. Yeah, Cleve. Uh, I remember yeah. us being out and you telling us the Zuni stories of the flood. Oh yeah. And I hadn't, I hadn't heard the specific details of that yet, but as you were telling the, the, the Zuni uh, story of the flood, I'm thinking, yeah, this is, you know, what, what struck me was that science and I'm not going to dominate. I'm just going to throw this out. Science has covered, made enormous strides in bringing together the pieces of this, story call it the grand story but there are significant pieces missing you go back to the traditions that have come down to us through folklore through legends through the through, through, through mythology through the the tales of that the storytellers have preserved orally it's bizarre it's like you've got two <laughs> things that that like just fit together yes it's like those missing pieces within the scientific explanation look to the myths look to the stories because they're there look to the symbols of the past they're there but i don't know we've got some kind of a psychic divide you know we have i mean it, it shows up in the attacks that have been made on people who are doing this kind of research by again by the, the self-appointed defenders of the status quo and I tell Graham has suffered an enormous amount of abuse heaped upon him. And what to me is interesting about it, though, is that when I look at the, the attacks on him and his work, and you actually go, there's very little there. There's, there, there's very little there to actually refute the things that we are bringing to the table. It's really more of just a dismissal. I mean, 
I've all I've felt a little bit, but not to the extent that Graham has. I mean, Graham has undoubtedly had to develop a a hide of leather, but <laughs> most of the attacks on him are uh, on his work really just amount to nothing more than personal attacks on him and name calling. Oh yeah, name calling. You know, by people who've not done one percent, one tenth of one percent of the research that he's done into those into that subject matter. But um, again, I think what will happen, though, we're coming together. I, I think of the story of J. Harlan Bretz, who, you know, documented the great floods of the Pacific Northwest, the greatest floods ever documented in the history of the earth. And it took him 30 years of obstructionism, of resistance before people, the defender of the status quo, the geological status quo, actually began to take a look at the evidence that he had mass, amassed. Now, he, has, he suffered the slings and arrows. He suffered the abuse, the, 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 uh, the dismissal, the, the ignoring of him and his work for 30 years. But he stuck to it. And in the end, he prevailed. And it's only when he, when he received the Penrose Medal, which is the highest honor in geology, at 96 years old, his only regret, he said, was that he had outlived all of his critics and so he couldn't gloat over them <laughs> <laughs> so cleve give us some if you uh, want to uh share anything cleve i'd love to hear from you too there's a lot of uh interwoven subject with the constellations and what's down here on on the earth the history of the flood along with the uh, where the subject we were talking about the line in and plus uh, uh, great cuckoo con in Mayan culture. It's the same thing over here in Zuni, which is a different uh, vernacular, but uh, it's a kolo we see, which is uh, a sea serpent. Now, if you look at like in Japan, uh, oriental places where they also have dragons which are flying, they have wings. But over here, they I classify them as as land and then water and then and then uh, airborne. So you got different, um, same thing around the world happening at the same time is what you're talking about, Dave. And it, it's in reference to the constellations within all these other uh, fraternities. And then when I did the recon uh, at Chaco Canyon and the petroglyphs, this, and plus the alignments, the constellation alignments, I would say, I was just blown away because it does uh, go in reference to the constellations and their movement. And they had people back then that would uh, trace or watch the sun and the moon and uh, make uh, certain uh, like uh, designated points or areas for, for alignment. And along with the, the harvest, uh, when to plant seeds, when to you know uh, harvest, when the sacred ceremonies are going to be happening, all this uh, was uh, set a long time ago. And like you said, Randall, a template, template where they they all knew what they were doing at the same time back then. But it goes more into history where there was uh, the trials and tribulations, the natural uh, catastrophes that my um, great, great grandma used to talk about. And now it's happening. And now we're in, we're right now, we're trying to figure out what to do in the future. We're trying to get all the, the information from the past, trying to figure out in the future, uh, right now, present and into the future. And it has to still do with the stars, the natural uh, cataclysms of, of uh, Earth and what as humanity did long time ago was uh, they had no choice but to go under go underground. That's where the ant people come into play and, and the people underneath the, the earth that were there and to help us. And with also the Zuni mythology that uh, 
uh, goes along with the uh, with what happened a long time ago during that time is with uh, like the Sun Father and the twin war gods, how we were taken out from the four world four worlds. Uh, I, I same along with the other uh, civilizations history at that time, they had the same um, like twins. Those are another different uh, areas where they also had the lightning bolts. They also had a lot of uh, instruments to help mankind. Like, and then they still go into the constellations. It all, it's all in reference to what's happening right here globally and what's, what's up there, uh, like the frequency, harmonic balancing that I was talking about. That goes up from here on up to the cosmos to each planet. So, and it goes to the constellations, like the eagle we're talking about, and all these other constellations. What's what's going on? It has a lot of uh, effects <clears throat> on what's going on right now. And we were talking about uh, the sextant, the wobble last time, the wobble of the Earth, and why there's a lot of fluctuations in the magnetic fields when it's going like that. And it's all like controlled by a higher source, which I call the gods. And we'll get more into depth in different areas of when we go to the, uh, when we finally meet up for the conference. So we're gonna go ahead and go into uh, more into depth of what your areas and how they are interwoven in divine order and plus the timeline. It's all, it's everything is uh, coming into, uh, into a larger uh, perspective for people to comprehend what's really going on right now. Of, of what the history of, of mankind comes up to as of right now and what to do in the future to, like I say, for our salvation. It's, it's really a uh, critical, what I call it a critical mass for us to get together and try to straighten or, or try to do, try to save this planet, you know, and try to uh, take the ancient history or ancient teachings from, from not just only my people, from other, from other tribes and other people to integrate, to learn from each other, to help each other. And, um, and you're doing that, aren't you? Because I know you're studying Pretty yeah, widely. I'm, I'm, I'm studying the, the Mayan Codex, I'm studying the Egyptians, the uh, back as the, the time travelers, 18 Rabbit and Atenhat, and their sons, uh, King Tut and um, Lord Pakal. So all of this is all interwoven way back when, and they were using the same elements, the lightning, the, the thunder, um, stuff that, uh, uh, you know, that I use now, you know, but it's, it's a very, it's a hardcore uh, uh, training or since I was lightning struck, I just had, uh, they took me to multidimensional worlds that there, are, there is a lot of uh, uh, scientific, reasoning behind a lot of things that's happened. So I use the scientific theories and then try to put it in application where in life experiences those, yeah, there is a, a thin, thin veil from what is real and what is not real, but it's, we know it's there. So that's why I'm gonna bring all this stuff uh, during the conference, of how we can integrate right now of how we can um, go about into the future, like you said, Randall, and that the questions that, the curious questions of, of what, what is on the other side, you know? Of what, what happens when, when all this knowledge, ancient knowledge was passed down through, through either through dreams or through uh, metam uh, metamorphosis of like, from like Zeus, you were talking about uh, the eagle associated with Zeus. 
And also, we also have uh, a lot of uh, mythological uh, beings in, in Zuni culture and tradition that coincides with what you're talking about, what, what these supernatural beings, what they had in along with like our knife wing, our, our mythical half human, half flying uh, being with uh, uh, flint knives going out and then coming back in, retracting and stuff like that. Wolverine? Well, a lot of, lot of things that seemed impossible back then and then there's no way it could, why should they make things, why should my ancestors make things up like this? And then after hearing a lot of uh, the oral stories from great, great grandmother of what happened a long time ago that just about like the migration stories about the, the great flood and all this stuff we're, we're, we're talking about and what ramifications in the future of what's going to happen when this happens. So she was talking about uh, the prophecies and how did she get that? Of course, or her grandmother's thought. So we teach each other orally of how, how things are back then what's happening now and what needs to be done in the future. That's why I, I'm trying to help humanity um, under, uh, comprehend that what, what we have in the beginning, we can still make it work right now. As long as we take care of uh, everything that we're talking about is in divine integration and divine order. But we just need to awaken other uh, people to, to let them know what's actually going on right now through history, through ancient teachings, through uh, enlightenment and everything that we're talking about. And then going to the stars, even going, asking the stars what's, what's happening, you know, because a lot of information now is out there that's unseen. But uh, we'll get into a lot more deeper uh, subject areas once you guys show up even with randall if he's gonna you know come in on you well i'm i may i may show up there's a possibility but i've i've committed to doing the um the remote um because it's coming the conference is coming right on the heels of a couple of weeks i'm going to be spending up exploring and guiding uh, some groups of people up in the great floodlands of the pacific northwest and this has been uh, a year, I think I pretty much committed to that a year ago, so I have to follow through on that. Um, but we'll see, I'll, I'll hold it open. Um, it could happen, but I, at the very least, I'm gonna be there on the big screen, right? Is that how you're gonna have it? Yeah, um, yeah, the big, big screen. The big, big screen. Yeah, not. A, I don't want any medium-sized screens. It's gonna yeah. be- screen, right? <laughs> You want the giant screen. Right. Well, yeah. Well, we got to have a big screen for my hair and my beard. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> so, um, uh, well, yeah, but I'm, you know, if there's a way I can make it work, um, I'm going to, but at the very least, I will, I will be there in digitized form. It's going to be a great conference. Yeah, I'm, no I'm really excited from this. We, we, I think people listening and watching should have a really a uh, little tiny taste of some of the subjects, but I just love how all the things that you said, Randall, and all the things that you said, Cleve, there's these resonances that I didn't even anticipate, you know, when I was putting my little presentation together, it just, um, you know, it's, it's really inspiring to uh, consider the wider connections because I'm diving into what I look at and then to hear kind of the interaction of other perspectives like Randall brought and like you brought Cleve and we're going to have George Howard's going to be there and Martin Gray and others that uh, are coming to this conference to speak. I'm really excited to see that kind of confluence of when the you know, different 
ideas are bumping into each other, new sparks start flying out in all directions that you might not have even anticipated mm -hmm. before. So I'm just excited about this conference and I appreciate Robert, you're putting this together and this Zoom hopefully gets people excited and let's uh, let's let's get the uh, word out so that people can put it on their calendars. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, we'll talk more about how we can begin to, you know, the, the blueprint has been sort of emerging out of the mists for a whole, for a century now. I mean, if we look at a lot of the work that we're picking up, at least like that I'm picking up and following on, I'm preceded by probably a good dozen or, or two dozen uh, researchers and investigators and scholars who already, I mean, I've got them, they're back there in my library that you see. But we were not in a position before where we could actually begin to implement the blueprint. And I think we now are suddenly finding ourselves in that position where not only can we, but we need to. And I think we have the tools now that we can actually begin to create prototypes of what a sacred civilization might look like. And this is what I would like to see happen over the next decade or two um, yes. as, as an outgrowth of these gatherings, of these sharing of ideas and consciousness and, and knowledge. And so that's a big part of where I'm going to be trying to, to move all of this is out of the realm of we're talking about it, we're sharing the ideas, we're meeting, we're networking, we're forming these tremendous circles of friendship. But now, what do we do? What, what, what is our course of action from here? And that's what, what I'm really it? interested in. How can we create a prototype? And, you know, hey, I, I don't know if I'm going to be around for 50 more years. I'd like to think I'm going to be because uh, some of these innovations, you know, it's kind of like I've felt pretty much immortal all of my life, except that uh, I'm not feeling quite as immortal as I used to. And I feel like, God, I am just getting started here. I, there's so much more to do that I got to be around for, for decades yet. But however many more decades of functional life I am blessed with. I want to do my part to try to help take this stuff, bring it here, bring it to the world, bring it to our society, and create prototypes. Because I think by, 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 by utilizing these systems, this methodology, this art, this, this integration of terrestrial and celestial, we are going to affect changes in human consciousness. Yeah. I have no doubt of that. And when I look now and I know that I, I see, you know, adolescents, young people living in an urban environment and bear in mind a century ago, 80% of people like in America lived in rural environments. Now it's 80% of them are in urban environments. And you have a whole generation of kids growing up now who couldn't find the Milky Way, couldn't even tell you the Big Dipper right? They don't, they're not, that's just outside the framework of their consciousness. And this is, I think, debilitating to, to the larger human consciousness is when you have so many people now who are not aware of the, the grandeur of this greater world. The one that our ancestors were so integrated with, right? You live in an urban environment, this night sky is now not part of your field of, of awareness anymore. I think part of what we need to do in creating alternative to, to create these prototypes is first, number one, we have, to, we have to develop modes of education that bring people back and connect them with, with, with the past, with, with our mythic past, with nature, with the heavens above. And it has to start with young people. And so this is you know, Robert, when you mentioned the, the sanctuary project, this is one possible way we could get started with that. And over the next year or two, we need to be looking at actual plan of action. And, you know, I've been a builder, an architect, a designer for my 40 years of adult life. And that's how my brain works. I go out and here is something that 
either doesn't exist or it exists in a form that it's it's outlived its useful lifespan and now needs to be restored, resurrected. So I go out and my job is to conceive of what's not there or to conceive of something that needs complete transformation, right? And then to implement that and bring that about. And this is kind of the metaphor that I'm using as a builder for all these years. It's like, let us at least in the next few years set down some cornerstones. Yeah. Let's pick up the trowels again and go to work and begin building the holy city. No, oh, this is great. I got to let my dog out. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to go now. That was my final word on the matter. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is really exciting. Bad. It this is really bad. exciting. Cool. Yeah. yeah. And thanks for sharing that vision, Randall. I mean, it's really personal, but it's also societal. And thanks for sharing, Cleve. Cleve. It's all good. I'm, I'm really excited. And, uh, <laughs> Come <to forever. laughs> yeah hey i feel like i can deflect thunderbolts cool all right bro. It's all inside of you guys all right uh, see you off. in sedona see i hope I, to see look, everyone in sedona i look forward to hanging out with you guys digitally and in person Yes. Yeah, that would be great. All right. Okay, guys. All right. Cheers, we'll, gentlemen. We'll reconvene again. And thank you for your time, Dave. Thank you for your time, Randall. Thank you, Randall. Dave. Cleve. Cleve. Robert. Robert. Dave. All right. Randall. Viewers out there in the world, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening.